morning. Welcome to everyone. Good to see Mike and Susan back with us after a little bit of sojourning. Gallivanting. <laughs> or gallivanting, as we say in Scotland. Uh, so, uh, today's worship, I'll be presiding. Uh, Robert has the reading from Luke 9, 37 to 50. Emmanuel will bring some thoughts to us around the Lord's table, and Mark will bring a lesson today. Next Sunday, Michael's presiding with Robert as a song leader. Kevin's got the reading, which is Luke 9, 51 to 62. Simeon has the Lord's table, and Emmanuel is preaching. On the cleaning for this coming week is Samuel and Ananta. Refreshments today, Robert and Karen, and next week, due to be Mark and Caitlin. Uh, please switch off all or silence all mobile or electronic devices during your worship. Even the kids' ones, please. Uh, remember, the cry room is available if your children need to be settled down. And if you're using the toilets, remember to clean the surfaces uh, after use and dispose of the wipes in the bins, not the toilet itself. And if children are going, young children especially, please uh, supervise them. Also, if you can keep any children's snacks in quiet containers, that would be uh, extremely appreciated as well. If you're going to the Kirkcaldy Social next Saturday, it begins at 1.30, so try and get there before that time. Our first song this morning is number 13. Again the Lord of light and life awakes the kindling ray, and seals the eyelids of the morn and pours increasing day. One of the most beautiful times of day is sunrise. Sunset's quite nice as well for that matter, but when you, you see the light starting to shine in the sky, I think it was yesterday morning Danelva told me she got up and uh, six o'clock was beautiful. By nine o'clock it wasn't so nice, but um, six o'clock was a, a beautiful sunrise. So, uh, And when you see the, the light getting brighter and brighter, especially this time of year when we start to see the longer days coming in, yeah, that, First phrase, again, the Lord of light and life awakes the kindling ray and seals the eyelids of the morning, pours increasing day, just the, the day seeming to be poured into our life each day. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thought. So we'll, we'll stand and sing this song, and then Simeon will lead us in prayer. Again, the Lord of light and life awakes the kindling ray and seals the songs of praises unto your holy name this day. We pray to you, O Lord God, that you open our hearts and you give us the listening ears to be able to listen to your words this day. And we pray to you, O Lord God, that may the words that we hear this day be dwell in us spiritually. As many who are still on their way coming, we pray that you hasten their footsteps so that they may meet us here and in one accord we'll 
completely unacceptable worship. We pray, O Lord God, for as many who are sick, that you stretch out your hands of healing upon them this day. As many who seek your face this day, we pray that you do not hide your face from them. Grant us all our hearts' desires, O Lord God, that as we have come here, we may not go back the same. Forgive us of our sins, O Lord God, and help us that our sins do not stand as an hindrance from blessing and blessings with us. Do more than what we have asked of you, O Lord God, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The next song will be 682. God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved that he the world that he gave us his son. He yielded his life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. After we've sung this today, uh, we'll ask Robert to bring us the reading from Luke chapter 9. But if you can, let's stand again to sing this one. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so Say Luke chapter 9, verses 37 to 50. Talking about the song there, the words about you know great things he has done. We'll see in this passage that um, you know Christ, as we know, has is all powerful, and with God's help, he was able to do something great, uh, remove uh, a demon out of a, a young boy. And further down in the passage, you'll see that he, he's one of his first times where he predicts uh, his death. So Luke chapter 9, verse 37. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming down, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, 
Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. For they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them, so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him anything about this saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side, and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is, who, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Emmanuel to share his thoughts at the Lord's table, we'll sing number 784. That passage that Robert read explains a lot of why Jesus came, um, came to do so many good things. But his primary focus was to come and die for our sins, because he loves us so much. So let's remain seated then as we sing number 784. Why did my Savior come to earth? again brethren um, it's another beautiful moment in God's presence and uh, going by the song 
the hymn that we just sang, it tells us about the reason why Christ you know, came to die for us. He did it for no other reason but love. He loved us so much, and God loved us so much that even from the foundation of the world, he knew that man was going to fall away from him, and he made provision for man's reconciliation back to himself through Jesus Christ. This love was demonstrated on the cross, where Christ laid down his life. He said it severally by himself, that he gave his life out of his own volition. Nobody, it, it was a decision that no one forced him to take. And the only reason why the just we choose to go through that route, to go through that torture, and so much pain for the unjust is love. And in the history of mankind, there is no greater love than that. There cannot be. For everything, that a man would do. Man would naturally look out for something uh, that we can call a direct benefit, something that will be a personal gain. But in all this, Christ didn't have a direct benefit. He didn't have any sin of his own. The account of the Bible tells us that it was pure and holy and without sin. But yet, he gave himself. He had the power not to give it, but he surrendered it willingly just for you and I to be here today. And as I say all the time, the only thing we can give back to him is to dedicate our lives to him. And on his own part, he's not expecting anything different from that. Paul, in his letter to the Christians at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I read from verse 23. Paul took the Christians at Corinth you know, back to the foundation, back to how this feast was instituted. It was not something that a group of people just sat down to decide, you know, to do in honor of Christ or to do on his behalf. Christ gave this specific and very straightforward command to his disciples. And the early Christians also, you know, continued because just the same way it was passed down to them. In Paul's letter to the Christians at Corinth, Paul reminded them that I didn't just initiate this. I received it from the Lord and I have delivered it unto you the same way, exact way that I have received it, received it from Christ himself. And in Acts of Apostles chapter 20 verse 7 as well, we see the example of the early Christians doing this upon the first day of the week. But then, in this letter of Paul, he says something that you know, I want us also to pay attention to. So that this feast does not just turn out to become a ritual. Something that we just feel, okay, once we are gathered every last day, we observe the Lord's Supper. And, you know, just for it. We really need to understand the reason and what God's expectations from us are. That is the only time that we'll be doing it for the purpose 
for which it was established. It was established for a purpose. It is the remembrance of Christ. And when we remember Christ, the only thing that we remember is his suffering and why he suffered. He suffered because of us. So I will read and I bring out a point from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, pro you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So here we can see, yes, Christ insisted it. He wants us to eat it, but it is for a purpose. Proclaiming his death. And when we do that, we also do it by our way of life. The only way we will eat this feast in an unworthy manner is when we continue to do those things that, we, uh, that, that uh, are not in line with God's will, which are sins and rebellion against God, for which Christ came to redeem us from, for which, as Christians, we, we claim to have repented from and that we are now you know, living a new life. So, if for any reason, as Christians, we have to go back to that former way of life, if for any reason, we have things that we are convinced in our hearts has been against God's will and we remain unrepentant, then we'll be eating this feast in an unworthy manner. And so, eating and drinking judgment unto ourselves. Brethren, we really need to pay attention to this. In the writing of Paul to the Christians at Rome, in chapter 6, he made a very clear point that as many that have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. And the moment we are raised from baptism, he expects nothing from us but to walk in newness of life. That is not limited to that point of coming out of the water of baptism alone. It's a decision to walk with God. It's a decision to serve Him. It's a decision to do His will all the days of our lives. It's a lifetime commitment that we have made with God. And it will be nice, it will really, really be nice if we can always be conscious of this fact and always strive to do everything within our power to ensure that we live as God expects us to live as Christians. That is the only way we will not be eating and drinking this into the condemnation of ourselves. Brethren, we are going to do as Christ did. He took the bread and blessed it. Shall we pray? Our dear Father who dwells in heaven, our hearts are filled with joy and gratitude unto you 
for this great privilege that you have given unto us, to be among the few who has identified this narrow way and are walking in it. Remaining on our feet and on track up to this point is not by our might or power, but by your grace, which has always been sufficient for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that Christ made, and we appreciate you for this beautiful moment that we are remembering what he did for us. We pray that you please accept our thanks. We lift up this unleavened bread that stands for the body of Christ that was nailed to the cross unto you. We plead that you sanctify it and that you sanctify every soul that shall partake of it as well. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us not to eat this to our own condemnation, but that we may continue to strive to please you all the days of our lives. So that whenever it shall be that our sojourn here on earth shall come to an end, that that eternal home that we are eagerly looking forward to, that we may be able to get there and reign with you forever. Thank you, Lord, because you are confident that you have had us this day, for we have prayed in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This too, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Our dear Father, we are grateful unto you for counting us worthy to be among those who are fit to partake in this holy feast. We lift up this fruit of the vine before thee, that you please sanctify it. Sanctify every soul that shall partake of it as well. As we drink, Lord, we beg you to help us to renew our covenant with you, to be more determined to continue to serve you and to work with you faithfully even till the very end. Help us to always remember the agony that Christ went through for us be in this our present state and that this may continue to inspire us to, to, to faithfully work with you and to your will. Thank you Lord for answering us for we have prayed in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Emmanuel, for those thoughts. Our next song is number 392, after which we'll ask Mark to bring up today's lesson. The song is 
but the beauty of Jesus we see in me. It's not about his physical appearance. Scripture tells us his physical appearance was, wasn't was something to be particularly excited about. I think it's Isaiah that talks about him being having no form or comeliness that we'd be attracted to him in that sense. But his life was a beautiful life. The way he lived, the way he um, went about his daily life and just teaching people and reaching out to people and helping people as we saw in, in, in the scripture reading today as well. There was a beauty, an inherent beauty within him. And so it's our prayer that that beauty of, that he showed the world would also be seen in us. So let's stand together and sing number 392. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me for his wonderful passion and I have a video saved on my phone, it's only short, maybe a minute and a half long, and it seems to be uh, from some sort of gospel concert. <clears throat> In the video, we can see a large number of the audience are using their mobile phones with their torches on, sort of like... So, <laughs> I have the lights on like this. And the speaker will go up. And the speaker very quickly advises them to swipe to their selfie camera. And as soon as they do so, the lights go out. The speaker makes the point that you cannot shine the light and focus on yourself at the same time. The speaker then goes on to say that phones are designed this way that the light and camera are separate, but that our spiritual life and personal life 
were not designed to be separate. I think they get their analogies mixed, and it felt a little messy to me. So I wanted to look into these things myself. <coughs> the first point I wanted to cover was the last one made in the video, that we are designed to have a cohesive personal and spiritual life. The original speaker claims that no matter where they are or what they are doing, they will shine the light of Jesus because it is who they are and what they were designed to do. <coughs> My only caveat here would be that the fact that it, they make it sound so easy, even though we know when we read in Romans chapter 7 that it isn't easy at all. <coughs> but now, it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For I want to do the good, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the very evil I do not want. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. So I find the law that when I want to do good, evil is pre present with me. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see a different law in my members, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that is in my members. <coughs> Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The speaker in the video may have touched on this before or after the clip, but because I only have the clip to work with, I believe we, we need to acknowledge this. We may have been designed to shine Jesus' light, but our sinful nature makes that more difficult, as Paul says. So it is a constant battle to do this, but one that is worth fighting. It's worth fighting because it is part of our core design. And so when we succeed, we are brought closer to God, and that desire to shine grows stronger. No, though we are not pushed further from God if we fail, because our original sin has already removed us as far from God as we can possibly be. There is no deeper in sin. Casting Crowns sing a song called One Step Away. The whole song touches on more than just this one thing, but the chorus is very poignant and it reads, One step away from surrender, one step away from coming home, coming home. One step from arms wide open, his love has never let you go. You're not alone, not alone. You're one step away, one step away. We are designed to sh shine Jesus' light, but sin makes that difficult. Thankfully, it is Jesus who makes it possible for us to only ever be one step away from getting back on the path we are designed for. Now, I want to return to the primary point of the video, that we are like mobile phones and that our, our light doesn't shine when we are focused on ourselves. This has resonated with me because it directly opposes much of what we're told by the world. We are told to be self-focused and ensure we're okay to the detriment of others. That our truth is more important than the truth. However, as we can see from various places around the world, this mindset causes far more problems than it solves. <clears throat> the fact is that we are called to be servants because that is what the God of all creation was <clears throat> when he came to earth as Jesus. He came as a servant. Now, when the, other, when the other ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. Jesus called them and said to them, You know that those who are recognised as rulers of the Gentiles will lord it over them, and those in high positions use their authority over them? But it is not this way among you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Something I find interesting is that when we look at two of the more well-known verses about being lights for Jesus, we see the, the concept of service reflected. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but, put, but on a lampstand. 
and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and give honor to your Father in heaven. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in can see the light. When Jesus likens his followers to light, that light has a function. A city with its lights on is a sign of refuge. The lights serve as a beacon to ensure travelers can see a place of safety. You don't light a lamp with the purpose of hiding the light. It is there to provide people the ability to see and avoid hazards. Our good deeds are the lights that highlight the glory of God. And the more good we do, the brighter that light shines. The more glory our Father in heaven gains, and the more people can be saved. Which is what God wants more than anything. Let nobody deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, God's wrath comes on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you at one time, for you were at one time darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For the things they do in secret are shameful even to mention, but all things being exposed by the light are made evident. Ephesians 5, 6 to 13. <clears throat> as, followers of Christ, <clears throat> as followers of Christ, we need to ignore the glue and glitter words of the world. They look valuable, but ultimately are worthless. However, glitter remains innocuous until you start sticking it on your face, convinced you look good. So more importantly, we need to avoid switching to the selfie camera. Matthew 16, in Matthew 16, we read Jesus driving home the point. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world, but forfeits his life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of, the, of his Father, and then, he, <clears throat> and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. You can't deny yourself if you're staring at yourself. Further to this, consider that if you are taking a photo of something instead of just using the torch, you have the option for the light beyond, but even if you're just taking a photo, the image quality of the back camera is, profound, is profoundly better than the selfie camera. For me, this is just further emphasis that the idea you don't get the best results when you focus on yourself. As I said before, the video is short, and as such, there is only so much I can know the speaker talks about. But for me, the way the speaker presents their point, they omit a hugely important fact. It's an issue with all analogies that in trying to explain heavenly truths, they are limited by earthly parameters. That said, I believe the fact omitted by this analogy needs to be brought to the fore because the speaker in the video emphasizes you, their audience, and I, then the speaker, a lot. The audience, to the audience they state that you you are designed to be the light of the world, and you are designed for your spiritual life and personal life to be one and the same thing. And of themselves they claim, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, it doesn't matter what room you put me in, I will shine the light of Jesus. It is who I am. Inherently, there's nothing wrong with that. These statements are true. However, my issue is one of semantics and the source of these statements. They are very self-centric. They allude to giving God the glory, but for me, he's God. He deserves more than just being alluded to. Simply, it would be easy to assume that from these statements that we are the light of the world, we are also, that as we are the light of the world, we are also the source of that light. This just isn't the case, and hasn't been the case since the dawn of time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without shape and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the watery deep. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
God saw the light was good. So he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, marking the first day. Reading further into the creation story, we see God didn't create any vessels of light until day four. So the light could only come, have come from God. Interestingly, in 2014, a study was done on space. I know it's a vast subject. By someone called Yuna Kolmaya. That's, they seem to discover that there is 400% more light in the universe than can be explained. As yet, this assertion remains accepted within the scientific world and seems to support the biblical account of light without a source from the very beginning. Well, what does this mean for my message today? Well, just as God was and is the original source of light at creation, so he, as Jesus, is the original source of light for the new creation, what we commonly call the church. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by him, and apart from him, apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines on in darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. Then Jesus spoke out again, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. I have come as a light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned, the one who does not believe has been condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now this is the basis for judging, that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil deeds hates the light, and does not come to the light, so that their deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light, so that it may be plainly evident that his deeds have been done in God. Now some Greeks were among those who had gone up to worship at the feast. So these approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and they both went and told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the solemn truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The one who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be too. I, if anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Now my soul is greatly distressed, and what should I say? Father, deliver me from this hour? No, but for this very reason I have come to this hour. Father, Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard the voice said that it had thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, This voice has come not for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now he said this to indicate clearly what kind of death he was going to die. Then the crowd responded, We have heard of the law that the we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus replied, The light is with you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he went away and hid himself from them. You may have noticed in the last two passages from Scripture that Jesus discusses what his followers should do with regard to the light. They are to follow him, and in so doing, they will also shine the light. 
rereading part of Ephesians 5, starting in verse 11, we see how important that is. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For the things they are for the things they do in secret are shameful even to mention. For all things being exposed by the light are made evident. For everything made evident is light. And for this reason it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Interestingly, interestingly, <clears throat> there is a parallel between the original creation and the new one. And I don't think that I don't think has been acknowledged quite as openly as others. However, it reaffirms the fact that the physical creation is a shadow, a foretaste of the spiritual. If we look at the beginning moments again, we see that God is the original light, and only later does he create the vessels of light. So we see that the same thing with the new creation. Jesus is the original light, and only when someone comes to him in baptism does he then create a new vessel of light. Paul tells us that we are to be imitators of me, just as I am of Christ. This is how it is to be as vessels of light. We are to reflect the source of light, Jesus. And as vessels of light, we have to be functional, as I said earlier. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have this ministry, just as God has shown us mercy, we do not become discouraged. But we have rejected shameful hidden deeds, not behaving with deceptiveness or distorting the word of God. But by open proclamation of the truth, we command we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience before God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, among whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, so they have not so they would not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the glorious knowledge of God in the face of Christ. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not the night nor the darkness. So then we must not sleep as the rest, but must stay alert and sober. But our citizenship is in heaven. and We also await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his glorious body by means of that power by which he is able to subject all things to himself. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces reflecting the glory of God, of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is the, from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As Christians, we are told to let our, shine, our light shine before mankind. Our light is Jesus. As such, we need to be reflecting his light outwardly. I think it worthy of, of note that selfie mode on a camera phone is much, works much like a mirror. And in the same way that the light of the phone doesn't work when it is in selfie mode, we can't reflect the light of Jesus to others if our mirror is pointing at ourselves. A good few years ago now, the theme of Camp Tayside was Be the Moon, Reflect the Sun. You see, the moon is not the source of the light, but it's kind of like a big mirror in space. We can, we can only see it when it is in line with the sun. Like the moon, we can sometimes be full of light. Other times, earthly things can get in the way slightly so that we have, only have a waxing or waning crescent of light reflected. Other times, earthly things can completely block the light so that it appears to be no moon and no light. Sadly, there are times where we put ourselves first and try to eclipse the sun. The reason I say try to eclipse the sun is because much like during a solar eclipse, we simply aren't big enough to block the light. We just hinder it. All that being said, God, the God-given designed purpose of the moon is to reflect the light of the sun to the dark world. And our God-given designed purpose is to reflect the light, to reflect his son to the dark world.
At the end of the day, all I'm really saying is we ought to be the moon and reflect the sun. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Our closing song, uh, I think, fits really nicely. Um, it was planned because I knew what Mark was going to speak about today, but uh, so this is not one of those moments where God has guided us, other than he got us together before the event, and um, I picked the songs accordingly. Uh, but the, this closing song, 968, Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Let's uh, stand together and sing this, and then remain standing for Bill to do this in the closing. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine
thank you for the light of this world so we can see where we're going. And we appreciate the beauty that we see, but we know there's a greater light that you shine through your sun, Lord, that it shines in the spiritual world, that we can see things that the world cannot see, Lord, so long as our heart and our mind are on you and the, your things of your kingdom, Lord. And we thank you for the new creation of which we are a part, Lord, so help us to walk accordingly, Lord, that you might work in us, Lord, that we might please you and glorify you, not ourselves. Help us to always focus on Jesus as our example, Lord, and those who have followed him, like Paul, and the people we see in Scripture, especially the book of Hebrews, Lord, the, the people who are looking on, willing us on as we travel through this world, Lord. We know we will face difficulties and distractions, but help us always to look to you for our guidance and for our strength. Please forgive us of our many sins, Lord, and, and help us to honour you with words and deeds, Lord. Help us to encourage each other and keep in touch, Lord, with, with you and, and with your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.